Welcome back to Time Out with the Sports Doctor podcast, where life, sports, and medicine intersect. We're very glad that you continue to support this podcast. You can get the information on any platform uh, where podcasts are played, as well as getting the video content on YouTube. But if you want to just get one place to find all the content, go to my website at drgarrettbsportsdoctor.com and you will find everything on that website. So without further ado, let's get into this episode. So welcome back to another episode of Time Out with the Sports Doctor podcast. And we have another special guest here with you. I have another fellow physician and Dr. Gulshan Oberoi, um, who is a practicing neurologist. And, you know, just glad to have you on the show. So welcome today. Thank you for having me here, Derek. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think we've kind of talked about this podcast episode for a while now, but I'm glad our schedule's finally lined up to get it recorded. That's correct. Finally. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you can't really tell by looking at the video, but we look about the same size, but nowhere close. He's a a gentle giant. So how tall are you, Dr. Um, Oberoi? Six, seven. Six Six foot seven. seven. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's funny, you know, watching you walk up and down the halls in the hospital. It definitely look like you're coming out the the basketball court for sure. So, <laughs> but yeah. So Thank tell you. us about. I mean, you did have a career in basketball before medicine. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So I I grew up in India, uh, a small town in India, and uh, my dad was very pro sports. So he was a uh, hockey team captain of his medical school and okay. his high school. So he always encourages us towards sports, you know, encourages the kids towards sports. So I loved basketball from the very beginning, you know. So in my high school, I played it professionally. So the way it works in India is you you have a county, which we call as a district in India, you know. So uh, there are schools in the district that you compete with. So my school did very well on that. And we went up and represented the district in the state games. So then you, um, there are all the counties and the districts of the state. Uh, then they compete for it. And whosoever wins, they go to the national games. Okay. So um, I did that and we did very well. We won the first prize on that one. Then I represented my state of Punjab in the national games in India. So that was good. I used to play center. But then again, it wasn't a career choice for me because uh, unlike United States and India, it's not as lucrative. So you cannot have it as a career uh, option for a long time. You know, so... So that was my my sports journey, you know, but I still play it, but I I guess I, I went for my second option, <laughs> which was <Yeah>. medicine. <laughs> sure, sure. Good choice. Wise choice for the long run. All right. So you. you grew up in India. At what point did you come to the U.S.? Well, I came to U.S. in 2011, and that's when I joined my residency. I did some training before that at Columbia University in New York. Uh, so I did some training there. But uh, I I started my residency in 2011, and I've been here uh, since then. Sure. Was it always the goal to kind of get to the U.S. when you were growing up, or was that a kind of a family thing that they had in mind for you? A little bit of both. You know, it was it was more so my personal choice. I always wanted to be a neurologist. Um, you know, a sports is always you know dear and near to heart. Basketball has always been there and will always be there. But I always wanted to to do something in in medicine which I had a passion for. Um, I always had a passion for seizures and epilepsy. So when I was doing my medical school and during my training, people who had seizures or the kids who would have seizures, they would be widely neglected. There were not a lot of uh, treatment options available over there, or a lot of opportunities. So. I wanted to do the best I can to be able to help those people and the kids and also the parents who suffer a lot, who have the kids with epilepsy. So I wanted to to create a difference, at least from do my part in that regard. And that's what moved me to medicine. And I went to medical school in India and then I went, eventually wanted to do neurology and then um, eventually wanted to do a fellowship in epilepsy. Uh, so that's how uh, my journey began. And, and that's how I ended up being a neurologist and an epileptologist seizure specialist. Sure. So if we have any, you know, aspiring medical students or someone say, hey, this sounds interesting, kind of give your track of how long it takes to become a neurologist. Okay, yeah, sure. So in India, the medical school is five and a half years, you know, in the United States, it's about a four year, two year, four year of college, and then four years of uh, med school. But in India, it's a five and a half years of medical school. After that, 
the neurology residency in the United States is for four years. And if you want to subspecialize in something, which it offers a lot of opportunities, you can subspecialize in stroke, movement disorders, um, you know, dementia, you can um, do epilepsy, you can do neuromuscular disorders. So there are a lot of options for fellowships after that. And fellowships are typically one or two years. If you want to do interventional uh, neurology, it can go up to two or three years. So, uh, so that's the total timeline. So five and a half years plus four years, it's about, um, you know, nine years and then one or two years. So about a 10 or 11 year journey in total. Yeah. So a lot of sacrificing along the way, I'm sure. Right. <laughs> that is correct. Absolutely. So, yeah, you know, but if now, you love what you do, then the sacrifices don't come. <laughs> no, I agree. I agree. Cause you know, when I was talking about going into medical school and becoming a doctor, becoming a surgeon. People always say, oh, you're going to be in school the rest of your life. And now I always hear daily, you don't look like you're old enough to be a surgeon. So I always tell people, you know, decide what you want to do and, you know, get on the path because you can't listen to what all the naysayers have to say because many people that tell you things haven't been down that road anyway. So you have to really just determine if it's right for you and if it's a sacrifice is right for you. That is correct. I couldn't have put it in better words. Absolutely right. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about, you know, you have a, a busy, a very busy neurology practice. Uh, but one thing that we talk about quite a bit is business outside of medicine, right? And investing. So uh, let's talk about kind of your philosophy of, you know, you're a doctor. Why do you need more than just going to work to earn your income? Yes, that's a, that's a very good question and very dear to my heart. Financial freedom has always been very important for me. Uh, the idea of financial freedom uh, took place not out of necessity, but out of circumstances. COVID happened. A lot of people were uh, losing their jobs, um, medical, um, including in the medical fields, you know. And I was newly married for a couple of years, and then I have two little kids. And again, since being from a foreign country, I came on a visa. So at that time, I was on a visa. So if I were to lose my job at the time, not only had I had to find a job uh, within the next one month uh, due to my visa uh, requirements, uh, if I am not able to do that, and at that time, job market was tricky, especially in medicine, as you know, Derek, the other option was I would have to go back to India and start all over again, okay? Now that I have two kids and a wife who was not working at the time, I had a lot of financial responsibility. And that brought me to the place I, I was at. And, uh, and I started thinking, how can I be financially free so that even if I lose my job, uh, my kids are fed and, um, you know, I still have a good source of income to, to fall back on if time comes to that. So that's how I began starting investing, you know, more so in the real estate sector, but also in private equity. And the journey began in 2016, 2017, but it took a serious turn in 2018, 2019 when all this happened. Yeah, I want to say that, you know, I know it was a stimulus for me, and I think it was a wake-up call for many physicians and many other professionals uh, because it was very odd that we were in a medical pandemic, right? But physicians outside of those that were required to treat COVID patients were suffering and, you know, jobs were being lost, pay was being cut, and it was a lot of uncertainty for a couple of years, you know, we all thought maybe this is going to be for six weeks, maybe it'll be for six months. And then it just kept going on and on. I mean, I know surgery shut down at least three or four times in the first two years of the pandemic. So there was a lot of uncertainty. And I think it was an, a waking call for a lot of physicians and a lot of healthcare workers to say, this profession that we've held so tightly to, and we thought, you know, medicine has changed already just from when we were in training till now. Uh, with a lot of people moving towards larger corporations and a lot of hospital systems and away from private practice and entrepreneurship. Uh, but even on top of that, we were facing with a pandemic. So I think a lot of physicians realized that just going to work as a physician might not be as financially stable as we once thought it was. That is correct. Yeah. So let's talk about, you mentioned real estate, and that's something that I'm also very interested in. Uh, what's your philosophy as far as uh, real estate investments? Are you more on the active side or the passive side? What have you done so far? A little bit of both, active and passive. Okay. My philosophy on real estate was, like I said, freedom. Okay. Not mm -hmm. only does it give geographical freedom, 
but also financial freedom and time freedom. To put it in perspective, financial freedom as we know, I consider a person financially free when their passive income or income from their investments exceeds their monthly expenses, okay? So even if there is a job loss or if there is any uncertainty of any sorts, you won't lose your house. You would still have some income, you know, to pay your mortgages and stuff. And, and you would be net positive is what I call it at the end of the day. Right. So that's the financial freedom. Time freedom is very important. When you get financially free, you also have time freedom. So I don't have to work in my primary job for as long or I don't have to put so many hours to generate a certain amount of pay. So I don't have to be in that rat race is what they call it. So right. the third thing is geographical freedom. And that's also is very important. You know, I don't have to stick to a certain geographical area if I'm financially free. You know, if I decide to uh, move somewhere, I, I should be, I should have the, the ability and the choice to make it for myself. You know, so I think those three pillars are very important. And those are the things that drove me to investing in the first place. And real estate, I think it is a fantastic tool, especially in the United States. I don't know of any other country or I don't know of any place else which offers so much tremendous benefits, to, especially to the professionals and physicians and, and high income earners, especially the tax benefits that United States offers for real estate investors. You know, as there is a saying, don't wait to buy real estate, buy real estate and wait. You know, right. uh, it offers a lot of tax benefits, you know. Uh, so that's very important. And the other thing that it offers is I typically invest or try to invest my best in cash flow real estate. So cash flow is very important, you know, tax benefits, including interest reductions. And if somebody has an IRA, they can invest through the IRA into this. Coming back to the point of active and passive investing, my first investment that I had was in 2016. Uh, it was a cabin, a uh, short term rental cabin up in the Smoky Mountains area. That did very well. I kept it for over a year, uh, rented it out. I also uh, went there and enjoyed the time uh, when, when it was vacant. It was, it was good. I uh, kept it for a year, more than a year, and it uh, doubled in price. So I, I sold it at that time, and I thought that was a, that was a good rate of return on that one. And then my uh, practice kicked off quite a bit, and I got very busy in my practice. And then I, I couldn't devote a lot of time towards the active uh, real estate investing. So I decided to go to the passive side of, of it. Uh, that involved a lot of syndication deals where I invested as a limited partner or, or a passive partner. And mm -hmm. that um, gave me a lot of benefits. You know, I, I was able to choose the deals which I wanted. I, uh, I was able to do the deals which aligned very well with my investment pieces. You know, I was able to choose the, choose the sponsors and operators to my liking. I was able to compare the deals and then I was able to make my informed decision. Um, when I did all that, I am um, I totally, uh, I invested totally in about uh, 70 deals uh, so far, including multifamily, industrial, self-storage, mobile home parks, so on and so forth. Now, after achieving financial freedom as of today, I want to spread the word around. So that's my philosophy. And now I can say that if needed, I'm able to cut back on my practice and devote my time to real estate, which has always been my passion, you know? So that's the gist of it all, you know? Uh, so I created the, a company called as Vertical Mind Ventures. The mission of that company is basically to help physicians and other busy professionals generate tax efficient passive income, you know, and build generational wealth, not only for, for themselves, but also for their family. If you're enjoying this episode, don't wait to the end to share it. Share it now. Share this with a friend or a colleague that you think might find value in this information. And then also make sure that you click and leave us a five-star review and give us feedback because we really value your feedback and your input. Now back to the episode. Yeah, you know, it's amazing listening to you talk because I know three years ago, I would not have understood anything of what you said from passive to active, right? But the more that you learn, the more that you read, the more that you listen to podcasts or audiobooks or whatever to try to learn about these things, you pick up on them quickly. 
Uh, you know, I know I didn't have any formal training. Did you have any formal training in real estate investing uh, before I you started? Did not have any formal training. And Derek, like your podcast, it is fantastic. You know, uh, I used to listen to um, a lot of podcasts and you know, ebooks and audio books, and also real estate investing books. Uh, you know, that really helped uh, increase my knowledge towards commercial real estate and you know, multifamily real estate. And and that's how I got into things. And one thing led to another, and that's how I. I developed a lot of knowledge about real estate and that led me to to invest and and also lose the fear of not investing and you know because once you you gain knowledge that's when you become more confident in investing so that's very yeah. important that's the key and one thing people you know i know with me i would say it's risky but the more you learn the less risk there is involved because the more you it's a system to everything and there's a formula to everything and the more that you practice that and repeat it I'm sure the first time that you talked to a syndication, I know the first time I talked to someone about joining a syndication and they told me the amount and I was like, wow, there's no way I'm going to give this amount of money to anyone and I don't really understand what's going on. But once you have done it once or twice and you see, okay, this is a process of distributions and then you know you either sell or something happens and then you get your money back, it makes a lot more sense and you feel a lot more comfortable with it You know, the, the more you do it. Absolutely. And as they say, success is on the other side of fear and comfort, you know, and yeah. the other way to put it is comfort kills. So you have to gain knowledge about it. And what leads to it is, is progress. And once you, if you don't play the game, you don't win, you know, yeah. and as uh, somebody said, I believe it was Tony Robbins who said that progress is happiness. And I totally believe in that. Sure, sure. So are you doing your own syndication deals now? Or are you uh, working with a, a small group of people to put these deals together? Yeah, so we started off as a friend and friends and family, you know, mm -hmm. um, like I said, my favorite pastime is to help people understand about financial freedom. And a lot of my friends know that I do real estate now. And uh, we started this company just to be able to help people. So I still do a lot of passive deals. Uh, but we formed a company so we can uh, do active deals as well. We are primarily looking into multifamily, industrial and self-storage, you know, and that too, we want to have a cash flow play. Everybody has their own thesis. I don't do a lot of development deals. Um, my thesis is primarily cash flowing deals. Appreciation is gravy. I don't buy an asset just so that it's going to appreciate later on. As long as it cash flows, appreciation is going to take care of itself, you know, and as they say, the, the best investment on earth is earth you know if you have a, <laughs> a good property with good bones yeah. uh it's going to pay off so just kind of speak about you know you mentioned cash flow several times what does cash flow mean exactly so cash flow in the simple term means that if you buy a property uh you have to pay the mortgage on it okay if you pay the mortgage on it whatever else is left after you pay the expenses that is cash flow Cash flow is distributed to the investors either monthly or quarterly in general in the syndication deals. So what that means is if you in simple terms, if a property is rented out, uh, it means that it is generating cash or rent, you know, and after paying all the expenses, if you're getting monthly cash or quarterly cash flow, that means it is already de-risking your investment. Because it's um, if you put in an investment amount of, let's say, 50,000, you're always getting some cash flow, okay? And when the time is right, when the market escalates or when you get a good price uh, to be able to sell the property, then you make big profits on it. But until yeah. then, you enjoy the cash flow. All right, so thank you for that explanation. So, you know, talk to that busy professional who's saying, wow, this sounds interesting. There's something that I think I want to do, but where do I start? So what's a good place to start to learn about in syndications and investments? in real estate? Yeah, first of all, you have to be very knowledgeable about it. You have to learn about it right? because everything starts with baby steps, right? I would listen to the podcast about real estate. It's from the very basic. I would definitely rich, uh, read the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book, okay, by Robert yeah. Kiyosaki. Uh, that generates an investment philosophy, okay? And, and that was one of the first books I read. And if you're interested in, uh, in investing as a passive investor in syndications, there is a book by um, Joe Fairless. He is uh, a well-renowned syndicator. And the name of the book is uh, Best Ever Apartment Syndication. I would start off with these books and I would also 
look up the general uh, terminology that has been used in real estate, like IRR, equity multiple. Uh, so I would familiarize myself with, with these terminologies so I can understand and underwrite the deals in a better way. Yeah, it's really like, just like medicine, neurology has its own language, orthopedics has its own language, real estate really has its own language. And to study it, it's almost like taking a vocabulary test. And the more you see it, the more you read about it, the more you'll understand. That's absolutely right. All right. So please tell somebody how, number one, they can follow what you're doing or how they can connect with you to learn um, kind of on a one-on-one basis um, or to follow what your group is doing. Yes, happy to. So uh, the website is verticalmindventures.com. And the best way to connect me would be through email. Uh, my first name, Gulshan, G-U-L-S-H-A-N, at verticalmindventures.com. And you can also email to info at verticalmindventures.com. Okay, and we'll include all that information in the show note as well. So people will be able to connect with you. Uh, well, you know, thank you for coming on. And I just have, you know, on Time Out with the Sports Doctor, this is your final time out. I want you to be able to just kind of talk about your life in general. You grew up in India, you know, coming to the United States, being able to see a different way of living. How has that all kind of played into what you're doing now and your hunger to be able to become financially free? Yes. Yeah, so like I said, progress is happiness. And that that means a lot to me. I want to be able to not only do it for myself. If I can do it, I think anybody can do it, you know, uh, starting from basketball and then going into medicine and, you know, exploring real estate and doing real estate. I think when you set your hearts and minds into something, you can do whatever you want, you know, and it's just the mindset. You know? yeah. And I want to keep that mindset going. And uh, there's a lot to have in this world. It's an abundance mindset. But always keep in mind that, you know, you always have, uh, should always have a place to serve others, you know, and that's, that's the basis of humanity. And that's what I truly believe in. Now, that's great. And, you know, as we, we're teachers, right, in medicine, we teach, educate our patients, we educate other physicians around us, we educate residents, medical students, but this is a different arena that physicians and professionals need to learn about. So, you know, thank you for leading the charge in that uh, area. Thank you. Thank you so much, Derek. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. Thank you for continuing to support this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, then please leave a five-star review. And if you haven't done so, subscribe so you continue to get the updated episode. Until later, peace.